Thank you and welcome to our keynote presentation for the Lenar Student Board Water Forum. Tonight our guest speaker is Dr. Peter Glick, who comes to us from the Pacific Institute of California, which he founded and where he serves as President Emeritus. Dr. Glick has an illustrious career starting with various flavors of engineering, although he doesn't claim to be an engineer, degrees from Yale and Berkeley, followed by research and teaching at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, University of California, Berkeley. And in 1987, he founded the Pacific Institute for Studies in Development, Environment, and Security. He's published 11 books and many, many peer-reviewed papers. Dr. Glick has received numerous awards and honors, as many of you know. He's a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and I like this one. In 2008, he was named one of the 15 people the next president should listen to <laughs> by Wired Magazine. Um, I don't know if the current president listens to him. <laughs> He's very active on Twitter, uh, Dr. Glick. Um, <laughs> uh, I need to pause here um, because I can continue listing Dr. Glick's accomplishments and awards. Um, but I'd like to point out that for many of us, his greatest professional achievement is the impact that he's had through his very accessible writings that focus on emerging issues of water policy, climate change, security, and much more. Um, just pausing here, how many of you have read his papers in your classes, in your work, or in a Okay, just take a look. <laughs> Thank you. In 1989, when I was a grad student, just, just a little bit clear, I read his paper, Climate Change, Hydrology, and Water Resources. It was a reviews of geophysics paper, a review article. And um, I'm embarrassed to actually use this term, but it was life-changing. I realized that my snow research, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a snow hydrologist, mattered uh, to more than just the hydrologists, that mountain snowpacks are vulnerable to climate change. They affect uh, that vulnerability, affects water security, especially in rapidly developing urban areas across the western U.S. And so I, my work has continued in that vein for the last couple decades. Um, so thank you for that inspiration. So Dr. Glick continues his important research create crafting impactful messages about water resources, science, policy, and management. He's a prolific blogger, and I said before, regularly active on Twitter. His Twitter handle is at Peter Glick. His most recent publication is on the future of water, and tonight he is here to discuss the future of freshwater sustainability. So please welcome Dr. Peter Glick. Thank you. Yes, you can all hear me. Uh, thank you, Professor Cohen, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to all the students for all that you've been doing and for inviting me to the student forum. Um, I got a chance to sit in and see some of the presentations today. I missed some of them. But, but there is a lot of amazing work being done on water here. And I'm sure you all know about all of that. But it's really uh, uh, a core. There aren't many places in the country where this much could interdisciplinary water work is being done, so you should, you should be proud of that. Um, so, uh, water is a huge topic, as you all know. It, it's an interdisciplinary topic. It's related to everything we care about, uh, to human health, to ecosystem health, to the production of, of food, uh, to industrial goods and services that, that we use, to our daily lives, to ecosystem health, to, uh, to the climate change. It's connected to everything, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I can always find something new to do on water. Um, and what I wanted to do today is, is take, because there's so many experts here on different pieces of this puzzle, I'm going to get into trouble if I talk about something, something really focused. Uh, so I'm going to take a bigger picture, and I'm going to talk about this idea of transitions to freshwater sustainability. Um, and the really short summary, for those of you who have been working hard all day and haven't had enough coffee and are going to fall asleep, uh, I'm going to argue that we're in a transition now to freshwater sustainability, uh, that we're moving toward a future of what I describe as a, a positive future away from what we now have, which I would describe as unsustainable <coughs> freshwater management and use. And I'm an optimist. 
by nature, and some people say an optimist is just a poorly informed pessimist. <laughs> um, I think the transition will be slow, because transitions like this are typically slow, and I'll describe that. And I'm not suggesting that everything is hunky-dory and great. Bad things are happening now, and bad things will continue to happen in this transition, uh, and we need to understand that. But there are also things that we can do to make this transition happen faster, to accelerate the shift. And so I'm going to talk about all of these, these different pieces and what I mean by a transition and what I mean by sustainability and, and so on. But that's where I'm going. So sustainability. So first of all, no one really, we have trouble defining sustainability. It's a word some people don't like because it's ill-defined. Um, there are many different definitions. It goes, the term goes back 30 or 40 years before it really started to be used a lot. I actually like the term, um, but there's no agreement about a single definition. But here are some of the common characteristics that I think of when I think about, when I use the term sustainability. <coughs> the first is that world, the world's a complex place. A lot of different components are acting all at once in a lot of different ways. Rather than just energy or water or climate or any particular piece of the puzzle, the world is an integrated, complex place. And so sustainability talks about all of those things working together rather than a single, single resource or process. A second characteristic is time is important. And in particular, future generations are important. And this is something that economists don't really get, uh, who tend to think about short-term economics, with some exceptions, of course. But the idea of sustainability, in my mind, gives way to future generations, the values of future generations, the impacts on future generations, the ethics and morals associated with thinking about future generations. So that's another piece of this. A third is that resource renewability is critical, and this is obviously important for water, but it's also critically important for things like energy. Um, we don't want to be using resources that are non-renewable, that are unsustainable, because in the long run, they're not renewable and they're not sustainable. And so we have to move toward resource renewability, and this is really important for water. And I'm not going to talk much about this, although I wrote a paper a while ago called Peak Water that talks about uh, renewability and non-renewability of water, because it has characteristics of both. Um, and then the, the last piece of this is that the sciences and resources and engineering need to be integrated with economics and social factors and political factors, and this is true for water and it's true for resources in general, um, we're not going to address climate issues or water issues or energy issues successfully purely from a natural science or an engineering perspective or purely from an economic perspective. You have to think about those in an interdisciplinary way. And so those themes, I'm not going to repeat them very much, but they run through all of, all of what I'm trying to say today. So what are resource transitions? They're fundamental shifts in a policy or a belief system or technology or institutions or management strategies from one condition to another. It's a transition from something to something else. They can be fast or they can be slow. Right, and I'll give some examples of each. They can be linear or they can be nonlinear. You can be moving along a sort of straight path, or you can have sudden, abrupt nonlinearities. Uh, there may or may not be a threshold marking a change from one system to another. But all of these are factors that are relevant in discussions about resource transitions. So why do they occur? I should back up and say, a lot of what I'm talking about is I described in much more detail in a paper that just came out a month or two ago in PNAS on freshwater resource transitions. And I probably should have listed the URL, but, but if you look up my name and resource transitions in PNAS, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, you'll find it. And if you want, 
my email's at the end and send an email and I'll send you a copy of the paper. So why do resource transitions occur? Um, sometimes they occur when an existing system fails due to an environmental issue or an economic issue or a social issue or a political issue. Something happens and something goes wrong and the old system has failed. Uh, sometimes a, a new technology comes along and totally disrupts the way we did something, the way we operated something, the way we managed something, the way we behaved. Uh, sometimes it requires an alternative institution or some kind of a system to be developed that satisfies some kind of new social need. Some, something new happens and we need to do something differently. And I have to note that not all transitions are good. And the, the, our history is replete, unfortunately, with bad transitions. Transitions that occur for some one of, one of these other reasons, and we do something different, that new thing that we do may or may not be a good thing. And the transition from wood as an energy system to coal as an energy system was good for a number of reasons. It, it certainly saved our forests. Uh, it certainly changed the way we managed certain kinds of ecosystems. Uh, coal is a much more energy intensive resource per weight than wood. Uh, and it helped fuel the Industrial Revolution in, in Europe and in the United States. But for reasons that are now apparent to us, coal isn't such a great thing. And now we're discussing a resource transition away from coal. Um, uh, we moved to ethanol for a variety of reasons, which turned out not to be such a great idea for agricultural reasons and sometimes for water reasons. Uh, when we have a drought in California and we transition temporarily or permanently from surface water to groundwater, there are advantages to that, but there are disadvantages as well. So, as well. And, and you all can think of all of all of you can all think of examples in your own fields where we see transitions that that either are seem to be good, but turn out for reasons we didn't understand at the time or we didn't care about at the time to be bad. So keep that in mind. So why do we need a fresh water transition? Now he, here's an area where this audience probably doesn't really need this information. Uh, because you, you all work, or many of you work in these areas. But let me just describe briefly, this is sort of a way of thinking about the world water crisis. What, what are the challenges associated with water? So one of them is we are running up against absolute physical limits on water availability in many parts of the world. Uh, water is a renewable resource, mostly. But even for those renewable resources, when we use them all, we can't have any more. So think about the Colorado River. Colorado River is a renewable resource. What we use today on the Colorado has no effect on what nature delivers tomorrow in rain and snow that recharges the Colorado River. It's a renewable, it's a renewable river. But we use all of the Colorado River. It's completely allocated. And in a normal year, and even in a sometimes wet year, zero water reaches the mouth of the Colorado, the Delta in Mexico, because we've completely allocated it. That's a peak water constraint on a renewable system. And so in many parts of the world, we're running into limits on how much water that's available to use, we can use, or are using, or might want to use in the future. And that's also true for non-renewable resources like, like groundwater. So there are water availability problems in different parts of the world, in different times of the year, in different places for different reasons. But that's a challenge. It's the 21st century, and billions of people, 700 million people, lack safe, affordable drinking water. And 2.1 billion, 2.2 billion, 2.3 billion people lack adequate sanitation services, which, again, it's the 21st century, that's sort of inexcusable. It's not a technology problem, it's not an economic problem, but it's a fundamental failure of our water systems. And so that's a part of the water crisis worldwide. 
it's less of an issue in rich, developed countries, although uh, at the Institute we're doing work now on trying to quantify the numbers of people in the United States that don't have access to safe, affordable, safe defined in certain ways, affordable defined in certain ways, reliable drinking water or sanitation services. And the number's not zero, even in the United States. Uh, but that's part of the world water crisis. We have water quality problems in different places, at different times, industrial wastes, human wastes, all sorts of challenges with water quality. Uh, climate change is a reality. Humans are changing the climate, and, and among the difficult consequences, bad consequences of human-caused climate change will be a whole series of impacts on hydrologic systems, on water availability, on extreme events, on demand for water, on water quality. Climate change is a fundamental piece of the water problem, just, just as the water problem is a fundamental piece of the climate challenge. Um, and we see on the political side, uh, and I'll talk about this a little more later, uh, increases in violent conflicts over water resources. Um, trying to think about how much more I'm going to talk about this. I'll talk about it a little more later. There are lots of other pieces of the water crisis, but, but these are economic and they're political and they're ecological. Oh, there's one more. Ecosystems. Uh, many of the ecological problems that we face around the world are fundamentally tied to the water that humans take out of ecosystems for our use, or the quality of the water we leave or return to ecosystems. Many ecosystem problems are aquatic ecosystem problems, and that's a piece of the challenge as well. And there, there are other pieces of the problem, but we have a water problem. We have many different water problems in many places around the world. And so for those reasons alone, the fact that we have failed with the methods that we have used to solve our water problems in the 20th century to solve all of these problems, that alone suggests we need to be doing something a little bit different, or, or maybe a lot of things a lot differently. And that's part of the argument that I'm making for the need for a resource transition in fresh water. And again, I, I suspect I don't have to push that argument very far with this group. So some conditions that lead to resource transitions, and, and I'll talk in more detail about each of these, but let me just lay them out. Um, one is a change in some physical or natural condition. Another is an unusual trend, a threshold, or a tipping point, or a long-term trend in something that seems unusual. A change in demographic factors can lead to transitions. A change in technology, or a change in economics or financial systems. A change in social preferences, what societies want or like or do. Uh, the development of a new way of thinking, a new paradigm, a new way of evaluating the way we manage something. Uh, new kinds of social networks and connections among communities can lead to transitions. Strong leaders uh, or policy entrepreneurs can drive transitions. Political crises can drive transitions, and I'm going to talk about some of, the, some of these, most of these, in a little more detail with examples. So let me start with the first one, a change in physical or natural conditions. And again, there are lots of examples, but uh, this is one. Uh, this is global average temperatures on the planet, ocean and land temperatures. Uh, the y-axis is anomalies from the long-term average from 19, I think it's 50 to 81. Uh, and from time, 1980, 1880 to 2017, so last, last year. This is the temperature trend globally. Uh, this is a change, a fundamental change in some physical condition on the planet. Uh, this is human-caused climate change. And you've all seen this graph over and over again in different forms, in different places. But this is driving a change in all sorts of things, in the conversation about energy use, about the conversation about the climate, about political agreements at the international level. It's leading, in many ways, to a transition. 
Uh, this is sort of the same thing, but it's not 130 years of temperature. This is 800,000 years, and it's not temperature, but it's CO2 records in the atmosphere. And again, many of you may have seen this. The temperature graph looks pretty much the same. Uh, these, this is CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere taken from ice cores. This is paleoclimatic data from the Boston ice cores from Antarctica. And it shows a lot of different things. Um, it shows natural variability, ups and downs. I'm sorry, the, the y-axis is concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere in parts per million. Um, when CO2 is high, 800,000 years ago, the planet is in an interglacial, a warm period. When CO2 is low, these are ice ages. And the climate community understands very well what causes natural variability in the climate. Orbital dynamics, solar output, outgassing of volcanoes. There are a lot of factors that, that cause natural variability in climate. Um, so climate goes up and down. Uh, here, oh, Homo sapiens arrived, so we're talking a long time ago. And here's where we are today. The latest atmospheric concentrations of CO2 are about 408, 409 parts per million. This is human-caused climate change. This is the emissions of CO2 from the Industrial Revolution. Um, this is a change in a physical system. This is a change in data, a change in information that is leading to a fundamental transition on this planet. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is daily, daily average temperature in the Sacramento River above Clear Creek, which is one of the tributaries. Um, the y-axis is degrees Fahrenheit. The 56 degrees Fahrenheit threshold is the threshold below which Chinook salmon spawn successfully and the smelt survive, typically. Um, and the variable line from May of 2014 through October of 2014 is the temperature in the Sacramento River. Uh, this was a threshold event when the salmon were doing pretty well and then the temperature in the river rose for a variety of reasons that have to do with releases from reservoirs and the end of the, the snowmelt season and warm inflows and so on. Uh, and this was the death of 95% of the Chinook salmon run in the Sacramento River in 2014. We saw that again in 2015. This is a threshold event. It's a, it's a fundamental change in a physical condition. And there are many, many examples of this kind of thing. So another category, unusual trends, tipping points, threshold, sometimes it comes in here. Uh, this one's also related to Chinook salmon, but this is sort of a political threshold. So this is the winter run Chinook salmon again in the Sacramento River from 1970 to 2016 in numbers. The number of salmon that survive and escape to the ocean in this particular population. And you can see over time, from 1970, it's the population of Chinook salmon started to drop to, to almost nothing. And the threshold here was we got to a point where the numbers <coughs> led to a political decision to list the Chinook salmon as an endangered species. We passed a threshold, a tipping point, where from a legal and a political perspective, the Chinook salmon were eligible to be listed as an endangered species, a threshold event. And they were listed in 1989, and there's been some, some revival, but again, 2014 and 2015 were not good years, so I'm going to run Chinook uh, This is a, a graph that shows a, an unusual trend. This comes from uh, some work we do at the Pacific Institute. We maintain something called the water conflict chronology, says it right there, Water Conflict Chronology. It's an online open source database of every conflict, violent conflict associated with water that we know of going back 4,500 years. The first entries are like 2,500 BC. If you like history, 
including ancient history, there's some great, weird stories in this. Um, this is a graph that simply shows the number of events in the database per year from 1930 up until 2017. And it's showing a big increase over time. Now, maybe this is a tipping point. Maybe it's a threshold event. Maybe it's a change in some fundamental political factor. Maybe there's a problem with the data. We're very good at collecting data today on water conflicts. If there's a violent conflict over water, violent in the sense that somebody is injured or killed, um, my, my, excuse me, my magic little device tells me within a few minutes. Now, that wasn't true in the 1930s and the 1940s. So maybe there's a data issue here. But something is going on here that is worthy of thinking about from a political perspective, from a water management perspective, and we have a project to try and evaluate causes of conflicts over water, uh, what's going on, or are there regional trends, uh, and then we have a separate project looking at ways of producing conflicts over water, and that's a totally different talk I could give. Changes in demographics. Uh, this is a graph that shows urban, global, urban in blue, and rural populations worldwide from 1950 through 2050. And we had a change, a fundamental tipping point, if you will, in about 20, 2000, I forget the year, 2013 or 2014, when for the first time, the world population was more urban than rural. When the number of people living in cities was larger than the number of people living outside of cities. Before that, we lived in a rural world. And we now live in a population, in a world that's that's increasingly dominated by large urban populations. And that has enormous implications for a lot of different things, but including water. Because obviously the things that we need to do to address urban water challenges are different typically than the ones to address rural challenges. And so it means we have to think differently about water management along with a whole lot of other things. So changes in demographics are important. Uh, the world is increasingly younger. That's a critical issue. There are all sorts of demographics that play into the water challenge as well. A change in technology. Um, water is often a technology issue. Um, this is one of my favorite graphs. Uh, this is cholera death rates in the United States from 1900 till 1960 in deaths per 100,000 population. It's a death rate. Uh, on the y-axis. And you can't really see the little arrow here, but, but toward the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s, <coughs> the water community started to understand what caused water-related diseases. We, this was an improvement in biology, and bacteriology, and medicine, and we started to develop technology to address those problems. And this was a, a growth in biological treatment and chemical treatment and physical treatment of water and wastewater. So in 1909, 1908, 1909, 1910, the first wastewater treatment and water treatment plants in the United States that used chlorine and biological treatment started to be built. The first one, I think, was Jersey City, where we started to chlorinate water in 1909, and very rapidly, people stopped getting cholera and dysentery and typhoid and water-related diseases that were rampant in the United States, and now we don't have those water-related diseases, mostly, in the developed world, because of a fundamental change in technology and the way we treat and deliver safe drinking water in our municipal systems and treat wastewater. So that was a, that's an example of an incredible transition uh, from one health regime to another, from one water technology or lack of water technology to another. Uh, here's another example. This is total storage of water behind reservoirs in California. Uh, the global graph actually sort of looks the same. 
units are a little different. But the units are cumulative capacity in acre feet, um, up to 50 million acre feet. Uh, and there's a lot going on here. It's from 1850 to 2000. But basically, from 1850 until 1900, we didn't have big reservoirs. There was not a lot of water stored behind reservoirs in California or anywhere. And then, for a variety of reasons, we learned from an engineering perspective how to build big dams. And for political purposes and economic purposes, we started to build big dams. Uh, World War II was a big impetus for the construction of big dams on the Columbia River to power the aluminum industry uh, and the plutonium refinery at Hanford. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority was developed to um, bring rural electrification to the southeast and to power the uranium refining that was being done at Oak Ridge. Um, anyway, for, for a variety of reasons, we learned how to build big dams and we started to build them. And we built them. And here's Shasta, big increase in capacity. Uh, here's Trinity Dam, Mimax Checker, Oroville Dam, the biggest dam on the state water project system in California. So these are big increments in capacity. So technology led to a fundamental change in the way we managed large rivers and thought about droughts and floods and managed droughts and floods. And that was really an engineering thing. Um, and then it leveled off. And I could talk about this. This is another transition that I think we're in the middle of right now. Why is it leveling off? And I'm wondering now if I should tell you why now or if I should wait for another slide. Um, OK, I'll tell you why now. Uh, a lot of reasons. First of all, we built on all the good dam sites in California. And some would argue some not so good dam sites in, in California. And one could argue, for example, New Orleans. But we, we, that's a political conversation we can have later. Um, another reason is and this is related to transitions. In the 20th century, we didn't know or we didn't care about the ecological consequences of building big dams on rivers. It was more important to have flood control and drought protection and hydro generation and water supply. And we didn't think about ecosystems, or we didn't know about ecosystems. But, but we do now. And so any proposal to build a big dam today has to take into account ecological factors. And that's a, tr a social transition. That's a knowledge transition. It, it's contributed to this leveling off. There are other reasons as well that have to do with the way we finance these projects, that we don't finance them the same way that we did. So there are a lot of reasons for the transition in this, the transitions that you see in this kind of graph. All right, enough about that. Political crises or social pressures. Flint, Michigan. So we built a great water system, a great urban water system in the United States that much of the rest of the world wishes it had. And we got rid of cholera and dysentery and typhoid. But it wasn't as great as we thought it was. And we're not investing in it the way we ought to, to maintain it and to modernize it and to make sure that every population in the country has safe, affordable drinking water. And Flint, Michigan turned out to be a wake-up call. And for, is there anybody here who doesn't know what I'm talking about with Flint, Michigan? OK, you, you all know what's going on. We had a failure of an urban water system. And it was a failure for a lot of different reasons. It was a, there were, there were political reasons, there were economic reasons, there were environmental justice or injustice reasons associated with why Flint was as bad as it was, and still is in many ways. But in many ways, it was also a fundamental change. It, it woke us up to the fact that we're not investing in our urban water systems the way we ought to. It woke us up to the fact that there are huge environmental injustices in our water system still in the United States. 
it woke us up to the fact that our political entities are not paying as much or the right kind of attention to water as they ought to. It's driving a transition. And if there's any good news out of the Flint, Michigan disaster, it's that. It's that we're a little more aware of what we ought to be doing with urban water systems and with water systems in general. And, and again, I'm sort of an optimist. I'm going to take the good news out of that bad situation. But that was a political crisis. Uh, here's another one. And I know that there are experts here who know more about this. I'm going to try and say as little stupid as I can about this. But we're having a debate. Actually, I'm going to back up for a second so you don't get so you listen to me rather than trying to figure out what that crazy crowd is saying. <laughs> we're having a debate in California. You're having a debate in Reno. We're having a debate worldwide about, and this is another fundamental transition, about the use of recycled wastewater. And it's tied to this issue of there really is, in many parts of the world, no more new water. So we're having a, and I'm going to come back to this quite a bit, we're having a conversation about alternative sources of water. And wastewater used to be thought of as a liability. You, you collect it and you throw it away. Or if you're lucky, you collect it and you treat it, and then you throw it away. So now we're having a conversation about, all right, we're collecting it, we're treating it, often to a very high standard. Maybe we could use it. And that conversation is happening in California, and it's happening, it's happened in Singapore uh, with I'm going to Singapore, but Singapore has a very aggressive wastewater treatment and reuse program. It's happened for many decades in Vinhook, Namibia, which has direct bottle reuse and has for a long, long time. It's happening in Israel. It's happening more and more in places where there's no more new water to be had. So part of the challenge about recycled water is that it's recycled and that it sort of comes from wastewater. Okay, so there's a social issue here that has to do with public perception. So this is a graph that shows um, the percentage of people in San Diego, and they've done a series of polling over, over the years, in favor, strongly or somewhat in favor in blue, strongly or somewhat opposed in red, or they don't know, or they have no, no strong opinion, to the use of treated, recycled wastewater in San Diego. And there's been this weird transition. The first time San Diego proposed building a recycled reuse system, it was 65% opposed and 25 or 30% in favor, and a bunch of people, you know, 10% didn't have a strong opinion. There was serious opposition, and there were advertisements about toilet to tap, which is a phrase I really don't like, <laughs> for, for obvious reasons. But, but there was a lot of opposition. We're not going to drink that stuff. Don't build this plant. And they didn't. But now, in the latest survey in 2015, 75% or so are in favor of San Diego building and instituting a treated wastewater reuse system. That's a huge social transition. And I don't really know why, because they don't poll that very, very directly. I have a bunch of ideas, which I will share with you, un unformed, unsupported by data ideas. Um, one is that uh, during this period, there have been several periods of severe drought. And San Diego is vulnerable, especially to drought. Uh, and the whole state, of course, is. But so that was a problem. And so there was a lot of public education about, about the lack of water. And it changed behavior in a lot of different ways. And it raised the level of the conversation about water reuse. So there was an education component to that. There was also an education component about what treated recycled water really means. What's the quality of it? What's San Diego really going to use it for? It's not direct potable. It's indirect reuse. It wouldn't be necessarily for the drinking water supply. It might be for industrial uses or outdoor landscaping. There was a lot of education about it. Statewide, there was a lot of education about it. 
So for there are probably other reasons as well, um, but there was a fundamental transition which has changed public perception. Uh, and that's a good thing, and San Diego is going ahead, as are many cities now, with different kinds of wastewater treatment reuse systems. Um, another one is the creation of a new way of thinking about the way we manage fresh water. And I'm going to talk in a little more detail about, about this and how it sort of brings everything together. Part of this is that there's a growing understanding about the interdisciplinary nature of water challenges. There's conversations about the water energy nexus. We're starting to think about water and energy together, rather than water over here and energy over there, and, and we don't talk about them together. Or the water energy food nexus, or the water energy food climate nexus. Nexus is a, is a sort of like sustainability. It's a new buzzword. I also like nexus. <laughs> the idea is that water is an interdisciplinary issue, and we're not going to solve it unless we think about it in a cross-disciplinary way. Um, there's also a move, and this is related, away from the purely engineering approach to dealing with water issues, or the purely economic approach. And I have plenty of economist friends who keep telling me, all we have to do is price water properly, and all the other problems are going to go away. And I give them as hard a time as I do my engineering friends. Um, so there's a growing understanding of the, the need to do things a little bit differently, and that's part of this transition. But I want to describe it in, in a, a way I've written about in the past, which is something I call the soft path for water, which is derived from some work that was done in the energy world in the 70s by Amory Lovins at the Rocky Mountain Institute on soft energy paths, uh, where he was thinking about a new way of thinking about energy policy. And, and let me do this in a couple of ways by, by comparing the hard path, which is sort of what I think about as the 20th century approach, what we, what we did for water in the 20th century, and what I think we ought to be moving toward for the 21st century. So the first is the hard path built for water supply. The assumption was there was going to be some demand for water, and we have to build supply to meet that demand. And we built dams, and we built aqueducts, and we built groundwater extraction systems, and, and we built centralized water treatment systems, and we built hard infrastructure. And that infrastructure brought enormous benefits to us. Don't misunderstand me. That, that brought enormous benefits to us in terms of food production worldwide, in terms of eliminating water-related diseases, in terms of protecting against floods and droughts, but that was the focus of the, of the 20th century. The soft path says, let's think about water supply, but a little bit differently. And I'll come back to that in a second. The hard path says, let's satisfy some projection of demand. Population is growing, our economy is growing. We assume, and this is the way planners were taught, and are often still taught, how much water is some future city going to need? And what it's going to need is the number of people times the amount of water they're using today, or maybe the amount of water that we think they'll be using tomorrow, but some projection of demand, and we'll satisfy it. The soft path says let's rethink demand. And I'll go into a little more detail about that too. But the idea is, we don't want to use water, per se, except for fundamental things like drinking and ecosystem survival and growing food. We want goods and services. We want to grow food. We want clean clothes. We want to flush our toilets. Uh, we want to make semiconductors. And those things all take water. But the idea of rethinking demand says maybe we can do the things we want with less water. And it's this issue of efficiency and conservation. Now I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. The hard path says water is an economic good. All we have to do is price it properly, and the world will be great. I hope there are no economists here who are saying, boy, he's really mischaracterizing the world of economics. Right? 
so be it. <laughs> and the salt has, since water is an economic good, and let's think about smart economics, but water is also a human right. And in fact, the UN declared formally a human right to water in 2010. So how do we balance a human right and an economic good? That's an important question. It's a complicated question. And the soft path requires that we think about that question. Uh, the hard path thought about centralized treatment to one, typically, to one quality, potable water. And most of our water systems are designed to treat water to one quality and deliver it in one set of pipes for whatever uses you may have. So you're using incredibly high quality potable water for drinking, that's great. And for flushing your toilets, that's maybe not necessary. And for watering your lawns, that's really not necessary. And, and why do you have lawns? You live in Reno. <laughs> so that's, a, that's another issue. So the soft path says, let's think about the quality of the water we want to do the things that we want. And maybe we can do things a little differently. Maybe we want to build things a little differently. Maybe we want to distribute water a little bit differently. And, and that requires a, a new way of thinking as well, a new technology, a new infrastructure, and new management systems. The soft path, as I mentioned, didn't understand or gave no thought to ecosystems. And now, a soft path, a transition to freshwater sustainability, absolutely requires that ecosystems be a fundamental part of what we humans do with whatever we manage from a water perspective. And so protecting ecosystem needs and ecosystem health is critical. And, and again, from an institutional point of view, the hard path was mostly centralized management. Big water agencies, state departments of water resources, federal irrigation systems, big centralized management systems, typically. And the soft path says, maybe we could supplement that with community scale systems or with integrating energy utilities and water utilities so that energy utilities build things that maybe are less water intensive or water utilities think about the energy implications of their water treatment systems. It's a different way of thinking about institutions and management. And that, that's part of my argument for a soft path as well. So I showed this graph once before. I'm showing it now in the context of this water supply argument. We might build one or two more big dams in California. Uh, that's a debate, and that's a perennial debate. But I would argue that at the end of the day, if we do build one or two more big dams in California, that's not going to solve California's water problems. And fundamentally add to our water supply. As it is part of the debate about building new dams is there's mostly no water to fill those dams the way we manage our current systems. So the water supply problem in California is not a dam problem. It's not a traditional supply problem. But as I suggested, there are new ways of thinking about supply. And this is the groundwater replenishment system in Orange County, which is one of the first and most sophisticated water treatment and reuse systems in the state. And they use it for groundwater recharge and for ecosystem flows on the San Fernando River. It's not a direct potable system, but it's a long-standing water reuse system, and it's expanding water supply. And just to give you a little number to, to sort of put this in perspective, urban water use in California is about 8 million acre-feet a year. And for those of you on the metric system, I apologize. We have this ridiculous unit in the western United States. That's a, an acre foot is 1,230 cubic meters. You can convert. But urban water, total urban water use is about 8 million acre-feet for everything. A residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional. That's how we think about urban. We treat and throw away into the ocean, about 5 million acre-feet a year. That's a lot of water. And we only reuse, from a recycle treatment reuse perspective, about 17 or 18% of our wastewater at the moment. 
Israel reuses 80 or 90 percent of their wastewater, mostly for agricultural purposes. Um, uh, the potential for wastewater to be a new source of water is enormous. That's that argument. That's the argument I'm making. Uh, desalination. This actually, this is these are reverse osmosis membranes. It's actually in Singapore's wastewater treatment reuse system, but it's the same kind of system used for ocean desalination. Ocean desalination is a huge potential source, new source of water that doesn't require taking water out of rivers or groundwater systems. It's very expensive. It has its own ecological challenges, and I'm not arguing in favor of desalination in California at the moment, for example, but it's an option. And as water gets scarcer and more expensive and more valuable, uh, that's an option. Uh, stormwater capture and reuse, urban stormwater capture and reuse. Los Angeles is exploring ways of capturing more stormwater and using it to recharge local groundwater to supplement local supply. And more and more local communities and even rural areas are thinking about how do we capture and recharge stormwater in a way that we haven't in the past. New sources of supply, in this case, potentially valuable for ecosystem restoration. So there are a lot of things going on here. Demand management, I've hinted at already. Let's figure out how to use the water we're already taking out of the system more efficiently. That's a simple piece of that argument. Um, why do you have a lawn when you have a beautiful garden that is very water efficient? I have no, I have a beautiful garden. I live in Berkeley, California. Uh, I have a beautiful garden, no lawn. My outdoor landscape water use is a third of what it used to be. Uh, and it could be lower than it is now. Uh, uh, smart, efficient toilets. Uh, the toilet Average toilet in the United States sold in the 1980s was six gallons per flush. The federal standard today is 1.6 gallons per flush. That's a 75% reduction in water used to flush toilets. And frankly, the modern design toilets work better than, than the old toilets. Um, but, but appliances that use water. We don't want to use six gallons to flush a toilet. We want to flush a toilet. And, and there are toilets that don't use water at all, which I, I, I would note. Uh, and so if we can do the things that we want with less water, that's the demand management side of things. And the potential to do all of the things that we're doing with water with less water is enormous. And not even shown here is agriculture, which uses 80% of the world's human withdrawals of water. 80% of the water we use goes to agriculture. That's also true in the United States. Uh, the consumptive use. We could grow more food with less water. Uh, the Pacific Institute, my institute, did a study a couple of years ago in the context of the drought in California, looking at these strategies. Um, reuse potential in California in blue, and stormwater capture and rooftop runoff capture in light blue. Those are the two sort of alternative supply things we looked at. Uh, the two in the middle, the green and the red, are agricultural efficiency improvements and urban efficiency potential, um, ag efficiency potential in the sense of growing the crops we're growing today on the land we're using today, but with better irrigation systems and better soil moisture monitoring. So we didn't change crop type, we didn't change agricultural acreage. And it's a little hard to read, this is actually a map, that shows for different regions of the state the potential in the size and the pie chart of those options. And the numbers altogether are really large. Millions of acre feet of potential in urban efficiency, ag efficiency, wastewater reuse, stormwater capture. And it varies depending on where you are. The Central Valley, obviously, the big, the big potential efficiency improvements are agriculture. That's the light green, because that's where the big water demand in the Central Valley is. And on the South Coast, Los Angeles, San Diego area, Sacramento, in the San Francisco Bay area, the bigger potentials are urban efficiency potential. There's enormous opportunity to cut our total water demand without cutting the benefits we get. Um, but we didn't think about demand management at all in the 20th century, because there was always another 
river to dam or another groundwater aquifer to overtank. Uh, another piece of this is economics, and this, this is sort of a complicated wonky graph. I'm sorry for that. Uh, no, I'm not. Um, uh, this is the levelized cost of water over the lifetime of a system in dollars per acre foot for a number of options. And the options are uh, water supply options uh, in sort of purple, and there are ranges of light. The light is the higher cost estimate of the range, the darker is the lower cost. Um, efficiency measures, these are residential, this is all residential. Uh, in orange and non-residential efficiency measures uh, in red, outdoor efficiency measures or landscape. What this is basically showing, oh, I have to explain one more thing. This is zero. So anything above this line costs money to do. Anything below the line over the lifetime of the option saves money. If you do it, you save money. So two things to note. These are almost all traditional 20th century supply options. Uh, big surface storage dams. This is Temperance Flat, Shasta and Sites, which are the couple of reservoirs they're talking still about building in California, raising Shasta. Uh, seawater desalination, indirect potable reuse, non-potable reuse, brackish desalination. So the price comes down for some of those. Uh, stormwater capture. And then the efficiency demand management options. Now, one of the reasons that demand management options are negative cost is because we did an integrated assessment of these options. So it, it's not only that you're saving uh, money on the water, so toilets. When you replace a three and a half gallon per flush, uh, uh, okay, this is mislabeled. When you replace a, a six gallon per flush toilet with a three and a half gallon per flush toilet, you save money over time because you're using less water. You save more when you replace it with a one and a half gallon per flush toilet. But you're also saving water treatment costs because you have to treat less wastewater. You're saving delivery costs and there's energy there. When you buy an efficient clothes washer, you save some water. Actually, you save quite a bit of, of water. But you also save a lot of energy because they're more energy efficient. And it turns out you save detergent. And so when you look at the savings from an economic perspective, across the water energy nexus, if you will, or broadly, the economics look different. But we're not trained to build water systems like this. The engineers will tell you, all right, I can build a dam, and it'll produce water, and it'll cost us $1,000 an acre foot. But it's hard to get those same engineers to do this kind of economic assessment. And the people who make a decision about a big dam are not the same people who make a decision about replacing a toilet. That's often a consumer decision. So you want the water district, which is either going to have to buy expensive desalinated water or water from a new dam, or save water. You want the water district or the utility to think about those things. That's a really difficult, that's a new way of thinking about water, a new way of managing water. But economics is an important piece of this. Um, this is my, one of my favorite graphs. If you've heard me talk before, you've probably seen it. When I argued at the beginning that I think we're in a transition, a freshwater transition, this is part of what I mean. This is the total gross domestic product of the United States from 1900 to 2010, and total water withdrawals in the United States over that same period. Uh, the water withdrawals data come from the USGS water use data. And it shows a lot of different things. Water use on this side, GDP on the other side. First, it shows that over time, those things went up together. High, the larger your economy, I could have shown population on this graph too, the larger your demand for water. And that's the fundamental assumption we've always made in the 20th century. That's what drove new supply options. Economy's gonna grow, our demand for water is gonna grow, and it was true. 
for a long time. But then something happened, a transition, a threshold. Uh, something happened around the mid-70s. And we use less water today for everything. This is everything. This is irrigation water. It's domestic, commercial, industrial, power plant cooling water. This is total water withdrawals. We use less water today than we used in 1980. And on a per capita basis, we use a lot less water today because population is continuing to grow as well. This is a trans we're, in a, we're in a transition to something different, something better, I would argue. So think about this. If these two curves had kept going up together, <laughs> this water use graph would be up here somewhere. Total water use in the United States would be more than double what it is today. Where would that water have come from? We use 100% of the Colorado already. We use too much of the Colorado already. We're overdrafting the Central Valley and the Ogallala Aquifer and other groundwater systems. Um, we, we couldn't, maybe, maybe we could have found it, or maybe we would have gone to desalination and simply paid the price. But that would have been a totally different world. And, and there's lots going, there are a lot of reasons for this. It has to do with a fundamental change in our economy. We're making fewer things that are with water intensive industries. So to some degree, we've exported our water demand to other countries. That's part of what's going on here. In 1970s, we passed the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And the Clean Water Act set quality standards for industrial discharges. And it turned out that one of the best ways industries could meet water quality standards under the new Clean Water Act was to use less water and to dump less wastewater. And that led to a decrease in industrial water demand. We started to put in place appliance efficiency standards, toilets, washing machines, shower heads, that cut urban water use without hurting our economy. There's, there's a lot going on in this complicated graph, but it shows a fundamental transition in where we are. So let me close here. I think we're in a transition to, in the way we think about and manage water. I think it's a global transition, although it's happening in different ways in different places for many different reasons, because water is often a local one. But I think such a transition is needed for obvious reasons, and I think it's underway. And I think that's really good news, actually. Now, there are still 700 million people without access to safe drinking water and 2.3 billion without access to adequate sanitation. And we're still suffering from extreme droughts and floods. I mean, there are plenty of bad things, and ecosystems are still being degraded. There, there are plenty of bad things that I don't need to reiterate about the way we deal with water. But I think we're moving in the right direction. A lot of factors influence resource transitions broadly. Uh, a lot of factors influence the, the way we implement them, the speed of them, the effectiveness of them. And those factors are economic, and they're political, and they're social, and they're technological. But the more we understand about the need for a transition, the reality and possibility of a transition, and the way to move more quickly toward what, a future that we want, the better off we'll all be. Thank you very much. Where do you see the big changes coming in agriculture? Because it, it is the largest use of water for the yeah. big people. So let me answer a slightly different, that a slightly different way. The issue really is how can we grow enough food for the population that we need to feed, whatever that population is? And we should have a conversation about population, but not that. Um, because obviously the critical input other than land, to grow food is water. So there are a number of things there. One is enormous amounts of the food that we already grow never turns into a productive calorie that somebody consumes. It's lost as waste in the field. 
It's lost in waste between the field and the processing plant. It's lost between the processing plant and the, the store. It, it, there are lots of pieces of the waste puzzle, but a huge amount, and I don't know what the right number is, but 25, 30% of the food we already grow and the water we spend to grow it isn't productive. So we could do better with waste. Another factor is um, we could do better with irrigation technology. Uh, a lot of, and rain fed agriculture. Uh, about 40% of the world's food production comes from the 16% of the land area that's irrigated. So irrigation is critical. But a lot of food comes from rain fed agriculture, and there have been better improvements in yield and productivity on irrigated land than on rain fed land. But, but that's an area that needs a lot of, a lot of work. Another is diet. We, we grow a tremendous amount of food that we feed the animals that we then eat. And that's an inefficient conversion of calories. Um, so it takes a thousand tons of water, approximately, this is a rule of thumb, a thousand tons of water to grow a ton of grain. It takes about 16,000 tons of water to produce a ton of cattle because cows eat a lot of grain, and that's the inefficiency. So diet is important. Uh, the richer countries of the world eat a lot of meat. Many of the developing countries are eating more and more meat. More of their protein is coming from meat. That's going to put pressure on the water piece of this. But I had dinner tonight with three of your colleagues, all of whom are either vegetarians or partially vegetarians, and, I, and I'm sure I, I'm not a vegetarian, I, I would admit, but I eat a lot less meat than I used to. So dietary choices is a piece of that puzzle as well. So the answer is partly technological, irrigation technology. It's partly social, dietary decisions. It's partly management. It's all, it's all some of the things that I've talked about we're feeding into that. Um, you mentioned uh, waterless toilets, and a long time back, I'm sure you're familiar with the book by Sim Vander on toilet papers. And I know Sim. And you know Sim, who was what, the California architect at the time, so well placed about composting toilets, and yet that has just made no progress. And I can understand in heavily urban areas, you know, high rises, the challenges, but you know, the stupidest thing we can do is flush water in the toilet. So, how can we make more progress towards that? Even in places where you put in septic systems, even in places progressive as Sonoma County, there is no chance you can put in a composting toilet. So, so there's an old joke in the astronomy world that, that we're known among alien planets as the planet that pees in their water, <laughs> or poops in their water. Yeah, we love our toilets. We, we do. I'm. I'm you know, I, I talked about social transitions. I'm not totally holding out for a, the elimination of water-fed toilets. It's a tremendous improvement to move from six gallon per flush toilets. And the state standard in California is 1.2 gallon per flush toilets. And my toilet at home is a 0.8 gallon per flush toilet, and it works better than any toilet I've ever had. So, so that's not a zero water toilet, but it's, it, it's an improvement. Um, a good friend of mine had a com has had has a composting toilet, um, and it works fine. Uh, he has trouble getting his family members to use it, um, and it has an electrical it has an electrical demand. Uh, it, 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 I know this is a design that's a technology question, but but the broader issue you're raising is uh, sometimes the improvements that we would like to see. And the technologies that are available are up against social preferences, and and that's a, that's often a difficult that's often a difficult thing. Uh, I have a question about this this whole idea of demand reduction. Um, I think maybe I'm a little more of a pessimist than you are because one thing that I think might happen is that we'll just find new ways to use the water, whether that's population growth or new industries moving in or, or whatnot. 
And then what happens when the next water crisis hits and we don't have any room, any resiliency left in the system? Okay, I have a lot to say about that. Um, and I'll try and keep it short. Uh, there is something called Genome's paradox in the energy world, which is the argument that energy efficiency, and, and as you express it very well, energy efficiency improvements are partly negated by the fact that we just find other ways to use the freed up energy, and you made it for water. Um, and the other argument you made was a demand hardening, what we call a demand hardening argument, which is when you squeeze inefficiencies out of the system, then when there's a crisis, you can't cut water use as much as you would have if you, from a behavioral point of view. Um, let me tackle that one first. That one's partly true, but um, but every gallon of water that you don't use is a gallon that you can leave in a reservoir, which makes you less vulnerable to the next drought. That's one piece of the argument. The other is that we're never going to, not never, but maybe never, uh, eliminate all um, non-essential uses of water. Uh, I use water in my very, very efficient drought-proof garden. But if I had to, I could let my garden, even now, I could let my garden die if there was no water for it. I could still stop flushing my point down eight gallon per flush toilet. Uh, every, I could flush it every other day. There are always behavioral factors that give you, the, give you flexibility in, in dealing with short-term crises. And in the long term, if it's a permanent shortfall, we'll build a desalination plant and we'll supply water that we're willing to pay for. On the genome's paradox argument, um, I get this a lot in the agricultural sector, because a lot of the improvements in agricultural efficiency have not led to uh, returning water for ecosystems. They haven't led to an increase in stream flow. What they've led to is a farmer expanding irrigated acreage. That's not necessarily a bad thing, and it's not an argument against efficiency improvements for two reasons. First of all, if they're using less water to grow more food, that's an improvement in productivity and a valuable thing. You get more food per unit water, or the farmer gets more revenue per unit water, and that's actually a better measure of efficiency, and that's a good thing. But the decision about whether or not to leave water in a system for an ecosystem, to save water on a farm and leave it in a river, that's a policy question. And we could choose to require efficiency improvements that lead to some other benefit with the water. We could figure out how to use that water elsewhere. Now, in California, we're constrained by water rights, and that's a, pol a political argument or a legal challenge, but it's not overcomable, and it's, it's not not overcomable. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a policy question, and it's not an argument against efficiency improvements. I could go on. I wrote a paper about this in Water International a number of years ago. There are a lot of different ways of thinking about efficiency that get around the concerns that are often expressed about that. Peter, I have a question. Um, so I have a And for those of you who haven't, maybe I love this, but consumptive use is like what plants do with water, right? They take it up through their roots and then they plants use it, photosynthesis, and it goes out through their leaves into the atmosphere. So it's consumed by the plant. Non-consumptive use is what we do when we flush the toilet and take a shower. The water goes back through the wastewater treatment system and into the river. And so it's available for the next city. So we recycle water all the time. This is called non-consumptive use. So um, when urban areas expand into farmland, uh, then they're converting. I mean, we don't like about urban sprawl, especially urban sprawl into productive agricultural areas. But sometimes the value of the land is greater for urban areas than it is for agriculture. 
And you're converting that water use from consumptive use to non-consumptive use. And ultimately, you can end up with the same or even more water available, even though you're increasing the population. Would you care to comment on that? Yes, we make the same distinction all the time. It's critical for evaluating things like the efficiency question. Saving consumptive use is different than saving non-consumptive use. There's a bigger value to saving consumptive use uh, for a watershed. That's a critical distinction, and I, I didn't make it here, but, but it, it's an important. Frankly, that's a transition where you think about water. Uh, the distinction between consumptive and non-consumptive use has been very important from a policy perspective. Um, so I, I agree with that. Uh, there are all sorts of implications. It depends on where you are. It depends on the uses. Um, yeah, I don't have much more to add. But it makes it sound like urban's crawl saves water. <laughs> well, yeah. What water and how's it being used? And it does save water if it's converting a consumptive use to a non-consumptive use for that particular watershed. But at a cost. So. Peter, I had a question too. Um, you talked earlier about environmental justice, and a lot of these transitions that you've talked about are technological or other kinds of things. And I want want you, if you would, to put those two things together, in the sense that um, how does this notion of environmental justice and people having different access to things and different notions of technology and that fit with the kind of resource transition you're talking about in water? Well, so I think of it as a fundamental part of, of, the, trans of the soft path. But again, sort of like we ignored ecosystems, we also ignored disadvantaged communities. Uh, we either didn't understand that rural communities were more vulnerable to groundwater contamination because of what we're doing with ag chemicals or CAFOs or, or Whatever, or or they were communities of color and we didn't care. Um, I do think that's changing, and I, I do think it's it's part of the conversation about water in places like Flint, in places like the Southern San Joaquin, Joaquin Valley. Um, part of the challenge is it's going to require different institutions. It's going to potentially require new kinds of technology. It's going to require new kinds of management systems. It's going to require new financing. Uh, but, but rural communities especially have been totally left out. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act typically doesn't apply to them. Uh, small, anyway, I, I could go on and on. But, but I'm a little, again, I'm a little optimistic that the growing awareness of environmental justice issues broadly is bringing new voices into the conversation. Uh, we work very closely with a group called the Community Water Center in the Central Valley that works with, with farm worker communities on measuring water quality and access to safe water and the economics of that. Because they have to buy bottled water at a huge cost, which they can't afford. Uh, and working with governments to try and make sure that those communities are not ignored in water policy. Yeah, if I could come back to you, um, if I come back to Spencer's question, uh, was it Geo's paradox? Yeah, G -bon. G -E -B -O -S. G -bon. Par G -bon paradox. So it's kind of solving that. So when you decrease demand or you increase efficiency, you know you have this void that's just going to be filled in again. Uh, I loved your solution as you know you implement policy that can you know, fill that void to beneficial use. Um, so what are some sort of policies that you can allocate this freed up water? Or what are some ways, what are some, how can you allocate this freed up water that will benefit uh, society and ecosystems? Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so that's a legal and a technical question. It depends on where you are. I'm, I'm not a legal technical expert. Yeah. Uh, I'm a legal political expert, but um, the whole conversation about <coughs> understanding the need for in-stream flows or ecosystem flows, quantifying what those flows might be, and then figuring out how to provide those flows, 
is a ecological question, it's a technical question, and it's a legal question. Um, and it has to do with the Endangered Species Act, which is requiring temperature limits and flow limits for to, to protect salmon, or uh, or water trading policies that permit farmers to trade water in a way that permits us to leave in-stream flows longer or over certain stretches. There are lots of laws or management options or economic strategies that one could apply. And what works is going to vary from place to place. Um, we're having a hell of a time dealing with water rights in California. It's ridiculous. But we're beginning to set up some water markets because the legal issue is a tough one, but the economic one opens some doors and farmers are trading. And some of the environmental groups are learning how to help farmers improve their efficiency of water use, leave water in stream in return for a farmer downstream, transferring that water to a farmer downstream. So, I mean, there are lots of different ways of doing it. There's no, no one answer. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.